The reading is taken from the first chapter of Matthew, verses 17 to 25. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon, to the Messiah, 14 generations. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man, and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfil what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had born a son, and he named him Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Matthew chapter 2, the visit of the wise men. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men, and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. Now after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfil what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated, and he sent and killed 
all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled, because they are no more. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared to a in, in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who were seeking the child's life are, de are dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophet, prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. This is the word of the Lord. So we're beginning a series on Matthew's Gospel, and so we're going to spend a good section of this year looking at the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, the, the gospel is good news. It's good news for you and for me. I wonder when you think of good news, what, what do you think of? Does anyone have a... What, what is something that you hear that is good news to you? The birth of a baby is good news. So uh, one of the reasons it's such good news is often there's a, there's a hope in, in parents uh, the, the child that, that comes may eventually come and then the child comes. Uh, one of the things about good news is uh, the best of news is news that we'd actually hoped to hear. What, what, what are some of the other ways in which we might receive good news? Yes, so, so, so we've hoped for health and we see that day where illness is gone and health has arrived. Uh, other good news that we might hear? Uh, a visitor, some, someone that we may have longed to, to see or connect with. Uh, we finally get to see them. Uh, I like it when there's an update on my phone. It feels like good news to me and I fail to resist the temptation to hit update and sometimes that's a curse, it's not good news. Uh, but uh, but we, we have hope for lots of things. Uh, you may have seen me step over in the Bible reading. I, I hoped to put my foot on a spider and I missed it. It got back under the table. So sorry if you're up there singing afterwards. You may have been hopeful that I got that spider, but the, the bad news is for the person standing closer, there's a spider, but he's, the good news is, the good news is he's a little bit scared of people, so you may be all right. <laughs> We're looking at the good news according to Matthew. Uh, what does Matthew have to share with us? Well, in order to understand the good news according to Matthew, we need to understand the context of Matthew. For us, as we read the Bible, context is everything. We, we need to understand the world that we're stepping into because it's uh, written, spoken, shared with a group of people that weren't us. The, the good news according to Matthew is good news for the recipients. Now, we as the church today, uh, where some almost 2,000 years after Matthew shared his good news with the people. A lot's happened since then. Uh, a lot of knowledge has passed. And, well, it was probably written, uh, they, they say, uh, with Mark's gospel as a source. So it could have been anywhere from 60 uh, AD or maybe up to about 80. It's, it's hard to know. Uh, common agreement is the author was Matthew, which makes sense given it was referred to as the Gospel of Matthew. But, you know, people like to question these things. What purpose did it serve? Who, who was Matthew? Uh, Matthew, the tax collector, uh, the one who came from a, a Jewish background. Uh, it, it served to communicate particularly to people who had that view of the world in order to bring good news to them. So, so what, what does it mean for us? Well, that's something that we're going to explore, and we're not going to do all of Matthew's Gospel this year. We're going to cover a section of it across a section of this year. And I've been encouraging you to, to read through and sit in it and uh, understand it as we're going through Matthew's Gospel. And 
Uh, so do that in your own time. Matthew's Gospel uh, begins with these words, an account of the genealogy of Jesus. Uh, what it talks about is the origin of Jesus. Now, if you know Greek, the, the word for origin is Genesis. What does that remind us of? It reminds us of the first book of the Bible, the first book of the Pentateuch for Jewish people. And so as Matthew begins his gospel, he says, the Genesis. And when he says the Genesis, he's saying, actually something new is happening. The beginning of your old scriptures began with Genesis. This is a new Genesis to be found in Jesus. Something new is taking place, and the time of fulfillment is now here. So how does it present Jesus? Uh, we have uh, lots of ways in which it presents Jesus, just in this small section of the text, and we're on page 783. Uh, we see Jesus as uh, the son of Abraham, uh, what does it mean that he's a son of Abraham? All the promises that were given to Abraham are handed on through Jesus, that they will be a, a great nation, that they will be blessed by God, that they will have a land to themselves, that their multitude will be as many as the stars of uh, the sky or the, the sand on the beach shore. Their promises given to Abraham, uh, the fact that he's a son, mean those promises continue then to him. That he is the son of David. What, what does that mean? That we're, we're told here, and you see lots of these little quotes through chapter 1 and 2, uh, that there'll be a, someone on the throne of uh, David. And so that he's the son of David, it, it's significant because he was fulfilling that hope that they had that someone from the throne of David would continue and bring in a, a good reign and a good rule. Well, okay, he's the Messiah. What does Messiah mean? Uh, it's the, the Savior, the, the one who is to come, the, the coming, the, the expected one. Uh, that, that he was the Messiah. His name was Jesus. Uh, th this may come as news to you, but there wasn't only one person called Jesus at the time of Jesus. Uh, so... Uh, why, is he, why is it significant that he was uh, Jesus, born of Mary, born of... Well, this is a particular Jesus. This is not just uh, any. Uh, Jesus is a, a, a new form of Joshua, means God saves. So this is the one who saves, but this is the one who saves according to his lineage. What, what does it mean that he was the son of Joseph? Jesus the son of Joseph. Uh, it makes a bit of a point here. Joseph doesn't get a mention outside the infancy narratives in the Bible. Who was Joseph, Jesus' dad? But hang on, Mary, Mary is impregnated by the Holy Spirit, not Joseph. They didn't have marital relations uh, until after they were married. And so Joseph has in mind that he's going to quietly divorce uh, Mary before their marriage has been finalized. Engagement was like you were, you were married already in, in their days. It wasn't just a uh, you, you were engaged and then maybe you would get married. It was, it was definite. It was uh, sealed. And so that's why he needed to divorce her if he was going to break off that engagement and the, the consummation in marriage. So Joseph is making this plan of he's a righteous person. He wants to follow the ways of God. He's making this plan to get rid of Mary. What's the problem with that? What's the problem if Jesus isn't a son of Joseph? Well, Jesus' Davidic line, that he is a son of David, comes through Joseph. If Jesus was not the son of Joseph, then how could be a, he be a son of of David. So that's really significant. But hang on, you might say, he wasn't the son of Joseph, he was the son of the Holy Spirit of Mary. <laughs> right? That's, that's what it seems to say in the text. But what you need to understand is then context. Under the Jewish law, it was a requirement uh, for the father to, to name 
and accept as his own the son. If Joseph had gone and divorced Mary quietly, Jesus would not have been a son of David, but because uh, he was the one who gave Jesus the name, so verse 25, he named Jesus. Joseph was saying, this is my son. And because Joseph, in obedience to God after the dream with the angel, uh, named Jesus, Jesus was included uh, in the family of David, and all that was inherited through that line came. Now, right at the bottom of the list, you see uh, Jesus is also a Nazarene. Why is that significant? Uh, in the Hebrew language, Nazir means uh, branch. What does it mean that Jesus was a Nazarene? Uh, he, he was the branch that Isaiah spoke of, that a branch will be grafted in. To the stump of Jesse. Who, who is Jesse? The father of David. See all these connections that are being made. And so if you're a Jewish person sitting down and looking at all these names and these details about Jesus, you'll be going, he's the Messiah. This is the one that we've been talking about. You see, the Jewish people of the time, uh, life will be going bad for them. The life under Herod often went bad for them. And they would say to, to each other, you know, the Messiah is coming. Someone was sick or their business wasn't going well. You, you know the Messiah is coming. Living under a ruler that didn't treat them well, there, there is a Messiah that is coming. And so as they beginning to make these connections, it was significant that Jesus was a Nazarene. He was the branch grafted in. Another way that prophecy was fulfilled. That Jesus fulfilled all these prophecies is really, really significant. Think of the chances uh, in, in terms of uh, probability that Jesus would fulfill it. If you still carry coins, if you picked up a dollar coin and you put it on the ground and then you stacked a whole bunch of dollar coins on the ground, but you weren't just concerned to stack one coin there, you actually decided to cover all of Australia in coins, one dollar coins, and not just one coin everywhere, but you stacked them a, a kilometre high. That's the chance in terms of probability of Jesus fulfilling any of these prophecies, <laughs> let alone as many of them in just one section together. Highly improbable that Jesus would be connected in all these different ways. Uh, he was the son of Mary by the Holy Spirit. That is the Holy Spirit birthed in Mary. God grafted in. Why is that image in the branch significant? Because what is grafted in? Who took on flesh? God took on flesh. Came as Jesus, born of woman, of this, the line of David through Joseph. And who is he? What's one of his names? Emmanuel. That is God with us. God has grafted himself in to his people in order to save his people from their sins. He's the king of the Jews. What does that mean? He, he is a, a ruler who's come to reign. He's God's son. These are the, the names we are presented about Jesus. So uh, who was Jesus good news for? He was definitely good news for the, the people uh, living in Jerusalem, the, the Jewish people living under the rule of Herod. Uh, what we missed in our first reading with all those names, and uh, I love Will's account of it because he remembers all those names and all of us struggle enough just to pronounce those names. <laughs> uh, what, what we miss in there is there's some extra names. If you want to look down at the Bible, Ruth, what's... Ruth doing in there? What's Rahab doing in there? Well, does anyone know who they are? They're, they're women. What, what, what are they, what's the significance of that? Well, women were a big part of that genealogy. Well, what's significance about these particular women? Were they Jewish women? They, they, they weren't Jewish women. These were Gentile women. So who's, who's 
Jesus good news for? Jesus is good news for women, Gentiles, all people. Jesus is good news for those who are outside, that God is wanting to do a new thing and graft in a new people. One of the callings uh, of Abrahamic people is to be a blessing for all nations. That's really interesting, isn't it? That Abraham's people were called to be a blessing of all nations, for all nations. What's interesting is when you look at the way, because because there's a few Abrahamic faiths, when you look at the way that plays out, who are the people most concerned for the blessing of all nations? Uh, Unfortunately, uh, it's it's not any other other Abrahamic faiths. They're, they're, They're quite exclusive and protective of their own people their own power base, and yet Christians are concerned to go to the ends of the earth to bring the good news about Jesus to all nations because they believe fulfillment comes through Jesus and that Jesus is the fulfiller of what was promised through Abraham, desires to bless all people. So this is good news, uh, not just for those who are Jewish, but good news for all people. The context, though, is that it was written to a Jewish people, but it is, as we understand this context, good news for all of us. Uh, Herod was in charge when Jesus arrived on the scene. Uh, we, we've all lived under what we feel like a leader who doesn't look after us. Uh, Herod was the guy that, that, you know, he was extremely threatened as a leader. When, when you've lived under a fearful or threatened leader, the, you feel like you're walking on eggshells all the time. Uh, Herod was that guy. His own family would have felt like they walked on eggshells. Herod was the guy that uh, his wife and his son were killed, one of them, because they were trying to usurp his power. Well, that's how he felt. So Herod was an extremely threatened guy. So that there was a ruler or a king coming is good news. In an unstable and insecure world, Jesus is presented as a great hope for all people. What do we see that Herod does as soon as he finds out that there's a ruler coming? He's just had some random wise people come and say there's a ruler coming that's just been born. Think about it, literally. There is a baby that's been born. Herod is not going to even live to see this baby get old enough. And Herod is willing to then go and kill the infants under two years in order to prevent this ruler being raised up. Extremely fearful and threatened person. So for him, ruling people under his rule would have thought, well, this is good news. There is a ruler coming. Finally, we might have blessing and freedom. This is good news for us, that Jesus is the ruler, the good shepherd, who looks after his sheep because that means he wants to rule and shepherd us to all that is promised through Abraham is fulfilled in Jesus. Uh, Where where do we find our similarities with with the people of the day? You you might look at our leaders and go, oh, our leaders are the same as Herod. (laughs) Maybe, maybe not, probably not. Uh, Where where do we find our our similarities, non-rhetorical? Uh, th- think of people living 2,000 y- years ago. Where, where, where might we find similarities? I, 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 th- I think we struggle to, to see similarities. But, but I, I think as you go he- uh, through and you look at the context, there's lots of ways in which life uh, is similar. We, we, we wonder about leadership. Our leaders may look better, but we wonder about leaders. Uh, we're, we're very divided as a society. Uh, we would like to think we're tolerant of lots of ideas, but we're becoming less and less tolerant. Uh, where do we find differences with the people of the day? Well, we would look at it and we would look from a really practical perspective and say, well, we, we have non-dirt floors. <laughs> 
Uh, we seem to have wealth. We seem to have a bit of freedom. Similarities there, sure. What is the significance of the message for us? Why is it good news? In the world uh, we're in, uh, people have never had more freedom, never had more wealth, and yet never been more insecure, more fearful, without purpose. Where are we similar? Uh, you know, the, the Pharisees of the time thought they had it all together. Uh, they thought they had it all figured out. Uh, wh where are we, we similar? We're similar in that way. Where are we different? Actually, uh, we're under the illusion that we can uh, solve things, that we, we don't need a Messiah. So how is how's what Matthew got to share good news for you and I? That's something we're going to wrestle with. Actually, the good news of Jesus, uh, as Matthew shares with us, is, is good news because life works better with Jesus. I think we struggle to believe that sometimes, that life works better with Jesus. I think we struggle to believe it for us, and I think we struggle to believe it for other people. Uh, I think when you, you look at people pursuing success in the, this world and, and you say there's lots of opportunity and you can be successful and you see people being successful, I think, I think we wonder, well, where does Jesus fit in there? Is Jesus' job just to make me more successful? If I'm successful, do I not need Jesus? I, I think we uh, struggle and, and wonder whether maybe this is just an old idea that's not relevant for us today. Uh, if you're young and, and you're growing up in the world, there's, there's so many other ideas. We, we might look at what medicine has to offer, what psychology has to offer, and, and wonder, does what Jesus has to offer bring good news to you and I? And that's a challenge for us to wrestle with. Because if the gospel according to Matthew is not good news for them... And it's not good news for us. Then what are we doing here? I'm confident uh, that as we go through the Gospel of Matthew and as we read about Jesus, we see fulfillment happen through Jesus and we see hope offered as to what it looks like to live under Jesus' leadership, that each of us will be renewed in faith that Jesus isn't just the Messiah of the Jewish people. Jesus isn't just the Savior of those who are Christians, but Jesus is the hope for everyone in this world. That includes us, but that includes the world itself.